there were three <coughs> friends and they uh, decided they wanted to go hunting. Uh, there was a doctor and a lawyer and a preacher and so they got together what they needed and they went out to where they were going to hunt and they got out of their vehicle and they started to walk out into the woods and, and as they did this humongous buck started walking by and all of them saw it at the same time and they raised their rifles and they all shot at the same time and there it dropped. So they ran over there, uh, they started looking at it and they were arguing as to which one had actually shot, shot this huge buck. So they're arguing, it's becoming heated and all of a sudden they hear someone in the background and he said, hey, what's going on? And it was a game warden. And the game warden walked over there. He said, why are you guys arguing? And, he sa and they said, well, we all shot at the same time and we can't determine who killed this buck. And so the game warden started to look. And uh, he looked and he looked and he said, well, I know exactly who killed it. And they said, well, well who killed it? He said, well, the preacher killed it, of course. Well, he said, well, how do you know? He said, well, I, I know for sure because the bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> Here's the question. Have we allowed God's word to go in one ear and out the other? You, you might be saying, well, I don't know. I don't think so. Well, if we simply hear God's word and don't actually, actually act on God's word, then we're probably letting God's word go in one ear and out the other. If, if God's word hasn't changed us, which is at least one of the intents of God's word, it's not just simply to know, but it's to be changed by it, then we're probably allowing God's word to go in one ear and out the other. Lewis C.K. said this. He says, I have lots of beliefs and I live by none of them. That's just the way I am. They're just my beliefs. I just like believing them. I like that part. They're my little beliefies. They make me feel good about who I am. But if they get in the way of, want, of the thing I want, then I'm going to do what I want. Soren Kierkegaard said this, when you read God's word, you must constantly be saying to yourself, it's talking to me, it's about me. That's what I want us to look at this morning. That is what our text is stressing this morning. This, it's not enough just to hear God's word. We, we have to allow it to transform our lives. It's time for us, and I'm stealing this from Nike, to just do it. To just do it. So turn me, James chapter 1, starting verse 22. James chapter 1, 22. This is what it says. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, obey it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you have heard, then God will bless you for doing it. That's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at what this means for our lives. I want to look at what it means for you and me being transformed and renewed. In fact, this is the last sermon of this series. And as we go through it, I want us to ask ourselves, are we being changed or not? So this text, it actually gives us a few different challenges, and that's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at the challenges of this text. And the first challenge I see is this text really calls on you and me, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. James says, if, 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 if you listen to God's word but don't do it, he says you're fooling yourselves. In other words, you, you think you're righteous. You, you think you're doing well, but... You're really not pleasing God because pleasing God is to do what he asks us to do. It's to follow in his commands. 
I'm reminded of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Jesus says, hey, don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Don't be self-deceived. If you think you are a child of God, you have got to obey God. If you're not obeying him, you're really not living as his child. By the way, right after this text, Jesus goes on and he illustrates it. He, he says, imagine there's two houses built. And, and in my, my estimation, they, they probably look exactly the same on the outside. There's these two houses. They're identical on the outside. And they both know God's word. They've heard it. All of a sudden, the storms of life come. They, they start flooding and, and torrential rains and, and, and blowing against these houses. And one falls and one stands. They look the same on the outside. One falls and one stands. And you know what the difference is, Jesus says? The one that falls heard the word, and that's all they did with it. The one that stands heard the word and did what it said. That was the difference. The difference in these two houses were that one, they both heard it, but only one did what it said. Think about that. When struggles come, the world needs to see us living out what God's word says, finding that peace that surpasses understanding, living in the strength that God gives, obeying those things that we are called to obey. It's our standing on the promises of God, living by them, that becomes a foundation for us. I used to love watching uh, the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movies. In Dead Man's Chest, which picks up the story of Captain Jack Sparrow and his, and his friends, there's a scene in that movie that I think was interesting. There's two pirates, and I hope I pronounced their names right, Rigetti and Pintel. They're in this longboat out in the middle of the open sea. They just escaped jail, and they're headed to Cannibal Island with the uh, idea that they want to search for Jack Sparrow's ship, the Black Pearl. Now, in the previous movie, both of these pirates played a part, and they were sailors that were unable to die. But at the end of the previous movie, the, the curse was lifted, and so then they'd been sent to jail. So Rigetti's in this longboat. He's seated at the back, and he appears to be reading a Bible, which is upside down. He, he pauses for a moment, and he says, I say it was divine providence that escaped us from jail. Patel responds, I say it was me being clever. There's a dog at the front of the boat holding a set of keys. Turning to it, Pintel asks, ain't that right, Poochie? Well, how'd you know it weren't divine providence what inspired you to be clever, Rigetti asked. Anyway, I ain't stealing no ship. It ain't stealing, Pintel replies. It's salvaging. And since when do you care? Rigetti says, well, since we're not immortal no more, we got to take care of our immortal souls. Referring to Rigetti's Bible, Pintel says, you know you, know you can't read. It's the Bible, Rigetti counters. You get credit for trying. <laughs> you get credit for trying. You know, Rigetti's close to being right. It isn't trying so that we get credit, but it is doing and trying because we love and trust Jesus. That's why we do it. It's not so we get credit somewhere, like there's a ledger somewhere, but it is us proclaiming, I trust Jesus, and I love him, and so I'm going to obey him. In John 14, Jesus says this, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will continue, come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who does not love me 
will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. Jesus says, if you love me, you're going you're gonna to follow what I say. You're going to do what I've called you to do. So let me ask you, are, are you obeying Jesus? Am I obeying Jesus? Or, or are we just fooling ourselves? That's the first thing this text challenges me with, at least. The second thing it challenges me with is to take a closer look. Take a close look at what Scripture says and how you live up to it. In fact, James says, hey, if you listen to God's word, but you don't look at it closely, it's like you just glanced into a mirror. If you're not obeying it, it's like you glanced in a mirror, and then you forget what you look like. We are called to look closely into the perfect law. That's what he tells us to do. Look closely. Look carefully. Think about what that means. That means that, that I need to look into the mirror of God's word and ask myself, Am I looking more and more like Jesus today than yesterday? Does my walk with the Lord line up with the call of Scripture? Am I a trip reflecting the attributes of my Lord and Savior? You know, we, we ought to be looking into Scripture and saying, is this a picture of, of me? Is this what I really look like? I don't know if you've noticed, but everywhere you go, there is this onset, this increase in these self-checkout stations. They're, they're everywhere. In fact, you go down to Lowe's, you, you, at a certain time, you can't check out any other way than at the self-checkout station. Uh, but companies have figured out that these are actually, uh, can have some potential problems. They, they kind of promote shoplifting some of the time. And so they had an idea how to help stop the shoplifting. Does anyone know what they did? Some companies have started to put mirrors at the self-checkout. The self-checkout. And you're like, well, who cares about a mirror at the self-checkout? Maybe the mirror's there just so I can look good when I leave the store. Well, yeah, I'm looking pretty good. But that's not it at all. It may sound uh, ineffective, but the mirrors, in fact, start to make those who are thinking about stealing guilty. Mirrors are psychologically proven to make people feel guilty. In fact, to a letter from a, stu from a study in the journal, Letters on Behavioral Evolutionary Science, this is what it says, people who are in a self-aware situation such as in front of a mirror, they are less likely to engage in anti-normative behavior, which means they're less likely to steal and cheat as those who are not seeing themselves. The study noted that many participants who, subjected, who were subjected to the mirror, their private self-awareness was activated and it influenced their decision-making <coughs> despite the lack of social cues. These results suggest that social desi socially desirable behavior is influenced by mirror mirrors. In fact, Psychology Today postulated that mirrors allowed people literally to watch over themselves and therefore made them more likely to behave in a more upright way. Now, I don't know about the mirrors. I do know about the self-checkout. I don't like them. But nonetheless, I don't know about the mirrors. But I do know about God's mirror. God's mirror is much more powerful in front of us than any reflective surface you could look into. God's mirror has a way of, of cutting right to the heart of the matter. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, that's what it says. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his sight, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. God's mirror, the mirror of his word, 
penetrates our hearts, makes us look closely at ourselves. It, it reveals who we ought to be. But it doesn't just open us up to all the shortcomings. It also empowers us to change. 2 Corinthians 3, I love these verses. But whatever someone, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So, all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And then it goes on. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. As we look into the mirror of God's Word, it doesn't just reveal our shortcomings, our, our attitudes that are wrong, our, our, our self-righteousness. When we peer into it, 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 it challenges us, but it also changes us. It challenges and changes us. See, that's my question. As we look into God's Word, are we allowing it to, to reveal the shortcomings not just so that we can feel guilty, but so that we can change. Are we allowing God's word and his spirit to transform us? Are we studying God's word with the eye of transformation? Or are we only doing it so that we can be acceptable? Yeah, so, so, so that we can get the things out of it that we want. So, so that we can... See things that benefit us, at least in our minds. I don't know if you know who Ian McKellen is. I hope that's how you say his last name. He is uh, the actor who played Gandalf on the Lord, in The Lord of the Rings. He is openly homosexual, and this is what he confessed. He says, whenever I go to a hotel, I check to see if they have a Gideon Bible in the, uh, at the hotel room. And if they do, I go in there, every one of them, I go and I tear out a specific page of the Bible. I turn to Leviticus 18.22 and I rip it out, the whole page, which is, if you are not aware, uh, a scripture that talks directly against homosexuality. He says, I think by now I've ripped out hundreds of pages of the Bible. And then he adds to it this, there might be someone who is, has insomnia and who decides they're going to read that Bible because they have nothing else to do, and they might be especially, in his words, vulnerable to what I really think is Leviticus's pornography. That's what he says. He, he comes to God's Word, and he says, I don't like this part, and I'm going to rip it out. And not just for me but I'm gonna try to rip it out for everyone else too. How many of us come to God's word with the same thing? We say something we don't like and we just avoid it. We may not actually rip the page out, but we just avoid it. We skip right over, well, I don't like that part. Jump, jump to the next thing I like. Go to the next place I like. In 2 Timothy chapter three, it, talking about God's word, it says all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Scripture is from God and it is designed to change you and me. To reveal, to correct, to teach, to prepare, to quit, to equip. All of these actions should be happening every single time we come to God's word. So God's word challenges us. Don't be fooled. God's word challenges, challenges us. Take a close look. And then one last challenge from God's word is live in blessing and freedom. And it's kind of the result of the other two, but it's live in blessing and freedom. In fact, James says when you look into God's word and you do what it says and you peer into it like you're peering into the, the, the reflection of who you are based on it, then it changes everything. It sets you free, and it blesses you. 
It isn't a check mark in heaven that you get or a pat on the head. It is a life of blessing and freedom that you get to live in. In fact, we've read this many times. I want to read it in the Amplified Version. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. That's what Jesus came. He came to, to, to transform our eternities, but also, I want you to understand, when you give your life to the Lord, your eternity starts then. Yeah, I'm, I'm eternally living with the Lord right from here, well, well, from when I became a Christian. I'm in life, not on the side of death. Nearly all those outside the church and way too many of those inside the church believe that God gave us his word just to see if we will obey him. It's as if it's a test. Here, here's, here's my word. Now, let's see who obeys me. Let's, let's see who, who follows me. Let, let's see who will submit to the test and be committed. God's commands are the path to freedom, not just the test. They're, they bless us both for eternity, but also for right now. In Deuteronomy 28, it says this. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. And then listen to this. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offsprings of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you will be blessed. Think about that. Blessed, blessed, blessed. It keeps telling us if you will listen and follow what God's word says, it's not just a check mark. Oh, I, I did this and I did that and I did that. No, it's a life of blessing and freedom. That's what God wants you to do, to live in a life of blessing and freedom. In fact, James 1, this is what it says about God. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down from our God, from to, <laughs> a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Everything good comes from God. We've been blessed. We've been blessed. Robert Kupferschmid was an 81-year-old with no flying experience. However, due to a tragic emergency, he was forced to fly an airplane on June 17, 1998. His friend, who was 52 years old, was the pilot, Wesley Sickle. While flying from Indianapolis to Muncie, Indiana, this pilot slumped over and died at the controls right there in the middle of the air. The Cessna 172 single engine plane began to nosedive and Robert grabbed the controls. He got on the radio and he started pleading for help. Nearby were two pilots who heard the call. Mount Comfort was the closest airport and the two pilots gave Robert a steady stream of instructions on how to climb and steer and the scariest part, how to land. The two experienced pilots circled the runway three times before this somewhat frantic and totally inexperienced pilot was ready to attempt the landing. Emergency vehicles had been called out and they were ready for what they thought was going to be a disaster. Witnesses said the plane's nose nudged the center line and then bounced a few times before the tail finally hit the ground. The Cessna skid off the runway into a patch of soggy grass and amazingly, amazingly, Robert was not injured at all. Now, what I think is so important about this is this inexperienced, never flown before, 81-year-old pilot landed the plane, and he landed it because he followed the instructions. He followed what he was told. Imagine what would take place in the lives of believers if we listened and obeyed God's word with the same earnestness, with the same desire. We, we don't have to understand all the whys or the hows of God's commands in order to obey them. I think that's a mistaken thing. We, we often uh, 
believe. If I don't understand the why and the how, I can't do it. Well, guess what? I'm not God, so I may not ever understand all the whys or the hows. In fact, it's not I might not. I will never understand them all. But I still trust him because I know he knows best. And I know he wants the best for all of us. So are you willing to follow God's commands and live a life of freedom and blessing? Or do you somehow think you know better? We're ending this series today. This is it. This last sermon. You might be grateful. You might be sad. I don't know. But we're ending it. But as we end it, we're going to, this passage I just read you, I, I want to share with you. This is our, this is what the leadership have picked out as our year's verse. This is the, the verse we're going to use throughout the year. In fact, the verses. And I want to read them to you again. James 1. Here they are. 22 through 25. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. We're encouraging everyone to take that, memorize that passage, and allow it to help direct our lives. Now, if you look at the front of our bulletin, it's on there. We have our mission statement, as it were. It's an acrostic of salt. Last year, it was serving the world. This year, it's applying the word. Now, we're not asking you to substitute applying for serving. We're asking you to add to serving applying the word. It's time for us to just do it. Let God's word determine and direct our lives. It's time for us to take every passage of God's word and determine what what is God saying? What is God calling on me to do? What is God wanting from me? Maybe it's just to glorify him. Maybe it's a specific action of faith. Maybe it's a reminder to trust in him. Maybe it's an action that we need to do to restore relationship. But we need to be taking God's word seriously. And the choice is yours and mine. It's one last passage. It's found in Psalm 119. I want to read to you. It says, I will study your commands and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Be good to your servant that I may live and obey your word. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. And they are wonderful truths. Francis Bacon said this. It is not what men eat, but what they digest that make them strong. Not what we gain, but what we save that makes us rich. Not what we read, but what we remember that makes us learned. Not what we preach or pray, but what we practice and believe that makes us Christians. What do you practice? Is it your word or God's word? We pray with me. God, I thank you for your word. And, and Lord, I pray that we will look into it because not only does it reveal who we are, but it also empowers us for who you want us to be. And so, Lord, that's my prayer. I pray that we will not fool ourselves thinking that we know what's best, thinking that, that we've got it all figured out, but instead, We will humbly submit to your word, following it, acting upon it, living it, being transformed by it. Lord, I thank you for each one here. And and I know as Christians, we desperately want to get closer and closer to you. We want to look more and more like Jesus, but so often we allow so many things get in our way. And Lord, I'm praying that that one of those things is not me. Let us us surrender and submit to your word. Let us grow, reflecting your glory more and more because your spirit is working in us. Let us be transformed and change the world around us. Lord, we love you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.